Well, hello, I'm Nairi Woods and I'm Dean of the Blavatnik School of Government. And it's a pleasure to have you all with us here today to listen to Joseph Nye. Um, Joseph Nye has come pretty much every year to the school since its foundation and was one of the godfathers of the Blavatnik School of Government offering advice to Oxford, to me, on the establishment of the school right from its start. But he's known to all of you as one of the world's wisest, most balanced commentators on American politics. Um, Joe Nye is one of those rare academics who's had a stellar academic career based at Harvard University and combined that with constant um, forays into each um, administration. He has served in the Department of State on the National Security Council. He was chair of America's National Intelligence Council. He served as Assistant Secretary of Defense in the Clinton administration. Um, his books have um, not um, told the story of that service, but rather set a clear framework for the principles and the understanding that he has brought to his work in public service. He's written about his, his founding book, Power and Interdependence, is one that every scholar of international relations probably started out reading when they started their studies. But his other books, The Paradox of American Power, Bound to Lead, Soft Power, The Future of Power, um, I, I could go on, um, have helped guide us to understand how America sits in its relationship with the rest of the world. Joe, it's such a pleasure to welcome you back this year with yet another book, Do Morals Matter? Addressing a question which I think every observer and friend of the United States asks themselves, particularly as they watch an administration which, is, which seems more chaotic in its application of principles than many previous American presidencies have been. So if I can turn now to um, Professor Joseph Nye, with huge thanks to, to, to Joe for visiting us again this year. And let me just um, share with the audience that you will get um, plenty of opportunity to put your questions to Professor Nye, and you can um, start your questions whenever you like in the Q&A function on your screen. And I'll be picking up those questions and putting them to Joseph Nye during this session. Without further ado, Joe, over to you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Nairine. It's a real pleasure to be back at Blavatnik, even if it's only virtual. I think it's about now that I was supposed to be there in presence. So uh, it's modern technology is providing a, a substitute of sorts. Uh, the book, uh, Do Morals Matter? Uh, the title is deliberately provocative because it has a question mark in it. And uh, when I told a friend of mine a year or two ago when I was working on it, that, that was going to be the, the title. She said, well, good, then it'll be a short book. And uh, to some extent, there's a, a, a conventional wisdom uh, in professionals in the area of international relations and foreign policy and so forth, that it's all about national interests. Um, interests bake the cake, and then politicians come along and sprinkle a little morality on it, like icing to make it look pretty. And uh, that, that's quite a, a, a prevalent view. I remember when I was working in the uh, State Department uh, some time ago on nuclear issues, talking to a French diplomat, uh, and I said to him in a, in a break in our time, I said, you know, what we're doing has tremendous moral implications. Do you ever think about this? He said, to me, there are no moral questions. There's only the interest of France. And I don't think he even knew what a profound moral judgment he had just made. So the reason for writing the book was to sort of attack this cynical view, which uh, is, as I said, quite, uh, quite often heard uh, in practice, but also very much uh, part of the literature as well. Uh, in that sense, the, I have two purposes in writing the book. One is, uh, basically to answer the question of the title, Do Morals Matter? And I do that by looking at the 14 American presidents since 1945 and asking, can I find cases in history where the moral views of the president 
made a difference to how history turned out, uh, sort of an existence theorem, if you want. And uh, uh, that purpose is dealt with, uh, and I'll talk about it in just a second. Uh, but the other purpose is the is all right. If morals matter, since as you might guess, I think they do. Uh, the, how should we think about it? Uh, what's the way in which you should approach it? And I give a framework for how to think about uh, morality and in international relations, and then apply it to these uh, 14 presidents, giving them uh, uh, scorecards, slightly tongue in cheek, uh, but illustrating the complexity of thinking about what I call three-dimensional morality, of looking at, uh, at all three dimensions of intentions, means, and consequences. But let me start with the first question of, uh, are there cases where history would have turned out differently if, um, uh, a president's moral views had been different. And uh, the, probably the, the most interesting case of that is Harry Truman. Uh, Truman is often uh, condemned morally for uh, dropping uh, an atomic bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. In fact, uh, when Oxford gave Truman an honorary degree in 1948, the distinguished philosopher Elizabeth Anscombe refused to attend the ceremony because Truman had killed so many women and children by dropping these bombs. Um, and so there's a general view that, uh, that Truman was amoral on this. In fact, the history is much more complex. Uh, there was a third bomb and Truman told the military he was not gonna allow them to drop the third bomb. Uh, because as he discovered the effects uh, on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, he felt that in his words to his aide at the time, I'm not going to kill that many more women and children. So the, the non-use of the third bomb had something to do with Truman's moral views. But even more interesting is, is if you go forward five years to 1951 to the Korean War, um, the Chinese had entered the Korean War, had pushed, when the Americans approached the Yalu River, the Chinese pushed back, pushed the Americans back down south. The Americans were going to lose the war. And um, General MacArthur, Douglas MacArthur, uh, said to Truman, uh, he was the commander in the, in the Far East, uh, if you allow me to use atomic weapons on five to 40 Chinese cities, I will win this war for you. Otherwise, you're going to lose. And Truman knew from his political advisors that if he, if he stalemated or lost the wars, that would end his or destroy his presidency. Uh, Truman spent some time trying to find nuclear options that were usable, but he couldn't find anything that wasn't going to, in his words, kill too many women and children. And so he told MacArthur no. And he made the decision not to use nuclear weapons to save the American position in Vietnam or to save his own political skin at home. And I could argue that that is probably a case where a president's morality made a huge difference. As Thomas Schelling uh, said in his Nobel Prize uh, lecture, uh, the nuclear taboo, that nuclear weapons were to be used for deterrence, but not for normal war fighting purposes, is probably one of the most important decisions or practices that has developed in the past 75 years or so. Uh, and that owes a lot to Truman's moral position. Sure, there were aspects of prudence and pragmatism and so forth, but it also had a lot to do with this deep-seated feeling that he didn't want to kill that many more women and children. So there's an example, if you want, of an existence theorem where the moral views of a president made a huge difference to history. And the cynics who say morals don't matter, they're just icing on the cake, get history wrong. Uh, what I'm trying to show, and not just in the Truman case, but in several of the other uh, instances of the 14 presidents I look at, uh, that morality was a major ingredient in the cake, not just icing that was sprinkled on, on top. Uh, 
that said, how should we think about morality? In other words, that purpose of the book to show that morality mattered. Um, I think I demonstrated these little case studies, vignettes really. Um, but the question is, once you say that, how should you think about morality? Because international affairs uh, is an extraordinary complicated and complex area and simple moral judgments uh, that uh, we often make are hard to apply. Indeed, there's a particular problem that a lot of Americans uh, engage in a, a sort of American exceptionalism in which they say, we see ourselves as a moral people, therefore if we do it, it must be moral, which of course is a great non sequitur. And uh, you, you know, if you look at how Mexicans or Filipinos might uh, look at the 19th century, they don't necessarily see Americans as a very moral people. Um, but the, uh, the American tradition has been, we ha have good intentions. So sometimes things go wrong, sometimes we get off track, but because our intentions are pure or good, uh, therefore, uh, what we do is good. Um, and I think that is an extraordinarily shallow form of thinking about morality, but it is fairly common. Uh, to give you an example, uh, Ari Fleischer, who is George H.W. Bush's uh, uh, press secretary, uh, said that uh, you had to praise uh, George, a George W. Bush, Bush 43, you had to praise him for the, his moral clarity. So that when he went into Iraq, uh, for example, it was for the best of intentions to uh, deprive Saddam Hussein of, uh, of nuclear weapons and to uh, bring democracy to Iraq and uh, later to the Middle East. But the problem with that is it's one dimensional morality. In other words, good intentions, therefore everything is okay. I use in the book a, a, a simple little, uh, what I might call homely example of why this is the wrong way to think. Um, if you imagine that your daughter is uh, going out to a school dance on a Friday night, but she has to be back uh, early uh, because she has examinations for university uh, uh, Saturday morning, and a friend says, I'll pick her up at the dance and I'll make sure I drive her home quickly enough and fast enough that uh, she gets a good night's sleep for the exams. And your friend with those great good intentions uh, doesn't pay attention to the means of the fact that the road has iced over, that it's been icy rain and the road is slippery. And he drives at uh, 70 miles an hour on this road and uh, he skids and goes off the road and hits a tree and your daughter is killed. Uh, what you have there is uh, good intentions, improper attention to means and horrible consequences, unintended consequences. You wouldn't say, well, the whole act was moral because of the good intentions. You would have said that there was a failure to do uh, due diligence about the means. And the result was what uh, in law is sometimes called culpable negligence for failing to think clearly enough or hard enough about the possibility of unintended consequences and to allow for that. And I would argue that that homely example, if you want, can be applied to George W. Bush's invasion of Iraq despite what Ari Fleischer says. For example, even if Bush's intentions were good, and we can debate that or not, but let's suppose that they were, just grant that for the minute. Um, he, they paid very poor attention to the means. There were lots of papers in the State Department and the intelligence community saying trying to bring democracy to Iraq is going to be too hard. It's not going to be easily done. They were discarded, they were tossed aside. And of course, when it came to consequences, the failure to do due diligence, to look at the prospect of unintended consequences led to horribly immoral outcomes. Uh, for example, rather than democratizing Iraq and destroying the basis for terrorism in the Middle East, 
uh, what he did was uh, build a situation where Al Qaeda in Iraq, which then later uh, develops into ISIS, uh, uh, rose exponentially as a result of the American intervention. And of course, we know the horrible consequences that that had. So I would, I would say that if we're gonna judge uh, complex international actions, uh, we have to look at all three dimensions, intentions, means, and consequences. Let me just take a minute on, on each of those. When we think about intentions or motives, you have to realize that it's more complex than it first looks. Uh, almost all presidents uh, state some pure or clear intentions, democracy, human rights, uh, freedom, whatever. Um, but that often gets uh, confused in practice their motives become more complex because personal needs and emotional needs creep in. Um, in a democracy, it's not surprising that a leader should state or noble intentions, but when it comes to actually implementing them, the personal needs of the president uh, have a big effect. I'll give you an example there from Vietnam. Uh, both uh, John F. Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson uh, believed or said that they could not allow Vietnam, South Vietnam to be taken over by uh, totalitarian communism from the North. So in that sense, uh, you could say that was noble good intentions from their point of view. Uh, but the interesting question is what Johnson did in uh, 1965 was to enormously escalate the American participation uh, to 565,000 troops. Kennedy had set a ceiling on 16,000 troops and never to be more than advisors. They, so there were about 160 or so American deaths in Vietnam uh, under Kennedy. Uh, of course, when you total up the whole war, it's about 58,000 under uh, Kennedy, Johnson, and Nixon. Uh, Johnson and Kennedy uh, both knew that this was in the long run a losing proposition. Uh, McGeorge Bundy, who was the national security advisor for both men, uh, was asked uh, after he'd retired, um, what do you think Kennedy would have done if he had not been assassinated and been reelected? And Bundy says he would have found a way to get out. Johnson, however, could not face that, even though he knew that it was a losing proposition, he felt that he needed to be uh, the man, he could not afford to be the man who, quotes, lost Vietnam. And uh, what you find in the uh, record of people who studied this closely is that Johnson, who grew up in Texas with a uh, school uh, 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 master mother and a, uh, uh, a very tough Texas politician father uh, feared being seen as a coward. That was the drama driving emotional need he had. Kennedy uh, feared being seen as dumb or not smart. And the result of their different emotional intelligence and emotional needs meant that even though they had the same stated intentions, the way it turned out in terms of policy and the immorality of the consequences was totally different. So, so when we talk about the first dimension, uh, uh, intentions, we have to look not just at formal stated intentions, but also at the emotional needs that lead to how the intentions are, are implemented. As for means, um, there are a lot of things to be said for means, but but one of the most clear uh, issues in means, which comes back down to us across the centuries from just war tradition, uh, just war theory, which can be traced all the way back to uh, uh, the fourth century uh, uh, in the Christian church, but which has been secularized as, the, as international humanitarian law and is embedded in the uniform code of military justice. And what that uh, question of how you use force is that force has to be used with discrimination between civilians and non-civilians or combatants and non-combatants, 
and proportionality. And uh, therefore, it's not enough just to say that I had just cause to go into a war. I have to make sure that as I apply it, that I have paid attention to discrimination and proportionality in the means. So that, for example, if you find that there's a terrorist who's holed up in an apartment building, which has a hundred families in it, and you know that if you drop a huge bomb on the building, you can kill the terrorist who's been very elusive, but you'll also kill the hundred families. Uh, proportionality says, no, you can't do that. That uh, that's outside the acceptable means. Um, so that tradition of how we think about means is pretty well established in international and also in our uh, military law. But there's another aspect of means, which is, uh, I mean, goes to back to what the uh, liberal philosopher John Rawls uh, wrote, uh, and which can be traced beyond that to liberal theory all the way back to the great English liberal theorists of the 19th century, Mill and so forth, um, which is a sense of respect for other people's institutions and rights. Uh, to avoid undue intervention, to try to leave aspects of their societies uh, to their own autonomy. And uh, that uh, is, I think, an equally important aspect of thinking about means. So just to say that I used force with discrimination of proportion uh, is half the answer. Uh, but there's also a question of, did I pay as much deference to the rights and institutions and autonomy of other peoples as the circumstances would allow. And then the third dimension that I discuss as a, in judging morality is, is consequences. If we look at consequences, we have to realize that uh, anytime you have complex social interaction, you're going to have unintended consequences. Uh, nobody can predict partic particularly well the details of how a uh, particular action in foreign policy is going to turn out. Um, and therefore, the question is how much uh, attention, how much due diligence was given uh, to the prospect of unintended consequences and thinking through ways to defend against their effects. Um, I'm always interested that uh, George H.W. Bush, Bush 41, the first President Bush, um, in the final days of his administration in December of 1992, uh, sent American troops to Somalia to distribute food uh, to starving Somalis. Um, and this was out of keeping with the way Bush usually thought about uh, uh, foreign policy as a realist. And uh, uh, he basically um, uh, saw this as a humanitarian gesture. I, he could not have foreseen that uh, they, the use of this food aid by warlords was a part of a power struggle in Somalia. And that when uh, the United Nations peacekeepers tried to prevent the warlords from misusing the food aid, uh, the warlords killed UN peacekeepers. American troops were then sent in to try to uh, defend the peacekeepers and to police the warlords, which led of course to uh, the shooting down of the Black Hawk helicopter and the fall of, of uh, a, a 90, uh, let's see, would have been the Clinton's first term. And uh, this in turn led to uh, uh, the fact that Clinton was unwilling to come to the help of uh, victims of the genocide in Rwanda in 94. So an action Bush took in 92 had consequences in the fall of 93, which had consequences in uh, March, April of 94, which involved, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of lives. Bush could not have seen that. And you could say, well, if the president can't foresee all these consequences, how should we hold him responsible? Well, I think one has to go back to this point about uh, 
was there uh, contextual intelligence? Was there an effort to do uh, due diligence, not to be able to avoid all the unintended consequences, but to think about their possibility and to think of what one should do to bring prudence to bear. And in that sense, um, uh, I think you might give Bush a by Bush 41, the father, a buy on the actions he took in Somalia in December of 92, uh, but you wouldn't give Bush 43, his son, a buy on uh, his invasion of Iraq in 2003. Uh, so there are difficult judgment calls that have to be made uh, when we think through uh, how we deal with consequences. In the long run, we have to place a, a strong emphasis on consequences. Uh, presidents or leaders are always trustees for their people. So sometimes they have to do things which might be ab abhorrent to their personal morality, but which are necessary for the protection of their people. Uh, the classic case of this was Winston Churchill's actions in 1940 after Hitler had taken over France. Churchill feared that the French fleet would be taken over by the Nazis. This would prevent the Royal Navy from defending the British islands. And so he bombed his ally. Uh, he killed 1,300 French sailors uh, in, a, in a, a bombing of the French fleet. But it was argued that this was necessary for the survival of the British people. And you could argue that in the situations of survival of lifeboat ethics, so to speak, that uh, uh, the questions of how you balance consequences, means, and intentions uh, becomes extremely complex. The problem is sometimes people will go from that uh, difficulty in the issues of survival to assuming that it deals with all of, all of foreign policy. Uh, many of the realist school in international politics will say uh, uh, there is international anarchy, uh, therefore you cannot take risks with any moral issues. You have to always think of survival of your people. But the interesting question is that most of foreign policy is not about survival. It's uh, rare that you get a situation like Churchill fixed in 1940. And when you treat all of international politics as though it's uh, the prospect of Hitler taking over the French fleet, you're ducking hard moral choices. Um, so for example, when Donald Trump responded to the murder of Jamal Khashoggi in the, in the Saudi consulate in uh, uh, Istanbul, um, he uh, said, oh, it's a tough world out there, get over it. Um, and he listed the interests the Americans had of arms sales and oil and stability in the region and so forth. So he was treating, and his failure to stand up for values to at least criticize the Saudis for their action was treating this as though it was a matter of survival. It wasn't. It was a matter of balancing different types of interests. And our values and what we stand for is one of those interests. So I often say when I survey the different approaches to international relations, whether it's realism or cosmopolitanism or liberalism, I say start with realism. Make sure that what you're doing fits with a realist model which is not endangering the survival of your people. But my problem with the realists is not that one starts there, it's that they start and stop at the same place. And what you need to do is go beyond that and to say, okay, once I've taken care of my basic realist concerns of being a good trustee for my people uh, in terms of their survival, uh, what about human rights? What about values? Um, and that's where the cosmopolitan and liberal considerations come in. So my feeling is that uh, uh, a lot of the way in which we have been applying or thinking about foreign policy morality uh, is too easy. It gives ourselves an out like that French diplomat I mentioned, and that we really need to push ourselves hard on thinking in all three dimensions. Just to, to finish up on this, what I do slightly tongue in cheek is give a scorecard to the, to the uh, uh, 14 presidents since 19, uh, 45, 
uh, looking at all uh, at each of these three dimensions and how they balance them. And uh, the presidents who come out in my top quartile are Roosevelt, um, Truman, Eisenhower, and believe it or not, uh, the first President Bush, George H.W. Bush, who brought an end to the Cold War without a shot being fired. Um, at the bottom quartile um, are uh, basically uh, Johnston because of his failure in Vietnam, uh, Nixon because in pursuing a decent interval in Vietnam, he uh, sacrificed 22,000 lives, American lives and countless Vietnamese lives. Um, George W. Bush, Bush 43, mostly because of invasion of Iraq and uh, Donald Trump uh, for a variety of reasons relating to uh, destruction of alliances, lying and so forth. Um, but I do put in the caveat that because it's not over yet, we have to give him um, what it is a university uh, situation. We'd say you get it incomplete in this course, but with a note from the teacher of needs further attention. But in any case, uh, what I try in the book to do is not to tell people that my uh, scorecards or my judgments on these presidents is, uh, is the final word. I say quite the opposite. Uh, what I'm trying to do is provide people with a framework for being more careful as they make moral judgments to avoid this sort of simplistic one-dimensional morality, which is all too common, and to at least balance these three dimensions of intentions, means, and consequences, uh, people will come up with their own judgments, their own uh, uh, decisions. But uh, uh, if we can, A, read the book and come to the conclusion that morals do matter, and B, that as we think about judging morality in international relations, that uh, we have to be more sophisticated and look at three dimensions, not just one, uh, then the book will have accomplished its purposes. And um, that uh, is why I wrote the book. But I'd love to hear people um, dispute it or provide alternative views or, uh, or whatever. So it's fun to be back at Blavatnik. Thank you hugely, Joe. Um, what a terrific start. And we've got a flood of questions flooding in. Um, and perhaps the first one, which has come in from a number of people from Socrates, Rana from Mehdi, Ascarie from C. Turner, they're all asking about where you began with Truman and the bomb. Um, and so one point they're saying is, if this was a moral decision, why did Truman not stop after dropping the first atomic bomb? Why did he proceed with the second? And does that tell us that actually his reticence to proceed with the third was simply a fear of the public reaction and other countries' reaction. Um, and, uh, you know, likewise, the other question is asked. So let me start with that question for you, Joe. Well, there's been a lot written about this, and it's, and uh, in trying to make up my own mind, I tried to understand this as best I could. I think what you found was Truman, who was not told about the bomb by Franklin Roosevelt. Um, was it's, as General Groves, the head of the Manhattan Project, which developed the bomb, put it, Truman was like a boy who's put on the back of a toboggan, which is already speeding downhill. It's conceivable he could have stopped uh, the dropping of the bomb, but the original plan was basically two bombs. One was a, uh, a uranium bomb, the other was a plutonium bomb, and uh, the plan was pretty much in place to do these. Um, and Truman could in principle legally have gotten off the tobacco and then tried to stop it, but uh, not very likely. So Hiroshima and Nagasaki, remember Nagasaki was just a couple of days after Hiroshima, uh, was pretty much baked in. But there was a third bomb on the island of Tinian, which would have been a week or more before it would have been prepared and ready for delivery. And that's where Truman decided to draw the line, where essentially he got off the toboggan. Uh, it doesn't, you know, you can, there's a huge literature about the ethics of Truman's uh, decision, which essentially was the inherited decision 
from Roosevelt, uh, uh, you know, would you save more American lives if uh, you dropped the bomb rather than invading the home islands? But also, would you have saved more Japanese lives? Uh, looking at the uh, the Japanese resistance on Okinawa, for example, uh, it's not clear what would have happened if you to Japanese lives if you had. Uh, invaded the home islands. So you can go back and forth on this. And as I said, Elizabeth Anston came out with a very clear perspective. The answer was no, but at least there is an argument there of balancing means, intentions, and consequences, which is one of the hardest ones to sort out. But on the difference between um, whether the, the line should be drawn between bombs one and two, that was pretty much a package, but there was space to draw a line between bombs two and three. Thank you, Joe. Um, let me move to uh, a question by Dario Moreira, which is um, asking your, is it right to isolate the morality of decisions to the individual? What about the advisors, the secretaries, the departments that surround a president? Um, another, um, uh, question people put is, does the buck always stop with the commander in chief? So Chris asks, you know, do, do is it always the president that should be, should ultimately take uh, responsibility for moral decisions? And I think, Joe, you know, you've been there, you've been an advisor to presidents. When you are in that seat as advisor, um, at what point is it moral for you to stop making the argument to the president? That what the president wants to do is immoral or wrong. Like, how do you how do you do that as a as an advisor? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the the questioners are correct that morality is not located just in one person, and a full account of the role of morality in foreign policy should indeed look carefully at the uh, uh, advisors. The uh, but it also has to go further than that into the Congress. Uh, you could even trace it into the body politic. So if you think of uh, Vietnam, for example, uh, you have to say, look at the role of, of uh, McNamara, of Bundy, Walt Rustow and so forth, uh, who were advising Lyndon Johnson, uh, but go beyond that and look at the members of Congress who were supporting uh, Johnson on, based on the domino theory, uh, look at the uh, public opinion, which uh, had this fear of, of uh, losing China being like losing, uh, losing Vietnam being like losing China. So the moral culpability in that sense can be spread quite widely and a serious discussion of the role of morality uh, should look at all those dimensions at, at different layers. Um, the reason I focused on the presidents was a at this was a short book uh, and uh, uh, trust and it was designed to do to prove an existence theorem. I, I didn't I, I wasn't writing a book showing how all morality uh, affect all decisions. I was trying to say if I can find, some situations where history would have turned out differently if it hadn't been for the moral choices of the president, that's enough for me to answer the question in the title, which is, do, does morality matter? Do morals matter? Uh, so I limited my aspirations in the book to that, but a proper account of morality has to go much deeper than I try to do in the book. I mentioned some of these other figures, but I don't, uh, I don't discuss in detail uh, their moral judgments uh, to, uh, to the extent that a good uh, book on morality would. Um, I'm more interested in proving that they matter, A, and then if they matter, trying to set up a normative reasoning um, that, uh, uh, about how you think about it. And that takes me all the way back to my days of PPE. But, uh, but it, it, to, in terms of one's personal judgments, um, and in my experience, at some point you have to be willing to resign. At some point, if you, if you feel that something you believe is deeply immoral and which is not consistent with your integrity of who you are as a person, then you have to say, I, I resign. Uh, there have not been many resignations. Joe, what's the closest you ever got to resigning 
Well, <laughs> I did, when I was dealing with nuclear proliferation matters uh, in the Carter administration, there was a decision about whether we would go ahead with reprocessing plutonium or not. And uh, I got word that uh, uh, the decision was going to be made to go ahead with reprocessing. I thought, I have uh, taken such a strong position that this is a mistake and this is the heart of the policy. I don't see how I can continue to continue to be in this position if, uh, if this is reversed. So I said to myself, I, if, if this goes the wrong way, I am going to have to resign. Fortunately, the president finally in the end came out the right place. Thank you, Joe. Um, Utkash Nortial asks, after hearing your ratings of presidents in terms of their morality, um, that it seems that you think that morality has a lesser pla place to, to play under realist presidents like Bush and Trump compared to liberal presidents like Clinton and Obama. Is it that black and white? Uh, no, it's not, because uh, realists have a sense of moralities. A, a realist is not necessarily the same as a cynic or a total skeptic. Um, some realists are total skeptics or cynics, but many realists essentially uh, place great emphasis on uh, stability. And, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, there is something to be said for that. Henry Kissinger famously in his disagreements with Henry Jackson over whether to put priority on arms control or, or uh, the, the exodus of Soviet Jews uh, said there are no rights among the incinerated. Uh, so there is a, there is a moral judgment um, among realists. One of the problems is when the realists say, uh, you know, I want all of security before I have any other values, where in fact they're are trade-offs, um, but it's not it's not fair to say that realist presidents are uh, a, a moral. Uh, they just put a different weighting on the values as to how they uh, trade off these uh, these issues. Um, on the other hand, some liberal presidents, uh, presidents who like Woodrow Wilson uh, or like. Uh, 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 George W. Bush with his freedom agenda, um, because they don't pay enough attention to consequences, uh, can have a very immoral effect. So, uh, you know, the famous phrase is that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So uh, I don't think you can just divide realists versus uh, liberals uh, in, in that simple way. Uh, each of these approaches has to think through how they trade off different types of values. There's quite a good application of this in, in another question by Dario Moreira, asking, um, you gave, you know, you very eloquently, Joe, talked about realists beginning and ending with the question of survival, and you pointed to President Trump's response on the Khashoggi um, killing. Um, Dario says, is it not, um, is it not hypocritical for a president to, in that situation, to proclaim moral values when underneath it, they are actually prepared to continue the relationship which they see as essential to their survival, that it might not jeopardize the relationship, but where is the line between values and hypocrisy for you? Well, it, it, uh, it's a great question because most of these things are trade-offs. Uh, America did have, uh, does have, interest in uh, uh, oil, in arms sales, in stability in the Middle East, and so forth. So Trump was not wrong to cite these. The question is, did that have to be all that he paid attention to? Um, even the Wall Street Journal, a conservative newspaper, uh, wrote an editorial criticizing Trump for failing to stand up for American values. Um, and in that sense, uh, you could have said, I'm not going to break off relations with Saudi Arabia. Uh, I'm not going to bomb Saudi Arabia. But I could at least have the ambassador make a statement, or I could withdraw the ambassador uh, for consultations in Washington. 
or I could have the State Department Assistant Secretary for Human Rights condemn this and make, and when the White House is asked if, if they approve that, they say yes. I mean, there are a variety of things which are a long way from sanctions or bombing, which uh, could have been done to reinforce uh, values. And in that sense, you know, it, yes, there are interests in, interest in arms and oil, but uh, values are also an interest. They, if you look at, um, at American uh, soft power, the ability to get what one wants through attraction rather than coercion or payment, um, our values are an important source of soft power. So when you think of our, of our interests only being arms or, or uh, uh, oil uh, and not our values, even if it weren't for their intrinsic humanitarian importance, uh, values also are interests. And Joe, does that work the other way? When other countries criticize America for its failure to uphold certain values or you know, when they make a moral critique of America, does that ever have an influence on American policy? Uh, were there times when you were in the administration that it did? In recent years, have you ever seen it have an, in, have an impact? Oh, I think it does. I mean, there is a, depending on the administration, I'm not sure it's had much impact in the Trump administration, because uh, Trump has had a, a particularly amoral view. Trump comes closer to that uh, cynical uh, view rather than, uh, than the uh, full realist view. But um, yeah, if, if, if you think about uh, the Obama administration or, or particularly if you go back to the Carter administration, uh, the concern about uh, criticism about uh, our whether we're being hypocritical on values certainly affected a number of human rights questions. Um, another question put by the um, audience is about President Obama. They said in your, in your categorization of presidents, you didn't mention President Obama. Well, of the presidents who weren't in my top four or bottom four, they're distributed sort of across the middle. And Obama uh, is in that middle category, which means you got a good grade, but not outstanding. And you avoided uh, uh, you know, a bad grade for failure. Um, I think Obama actually did quite well. Um, he gets quite a, a, a decent performance, but uh, I think that uh, there were problems in terms of, uh, uh, you know, how well was he able to uh, accomplish some of the uh, good intentions he set forth? And uh, did he make some mistakes? For example, uh, uh, Libya would be a serious mistake. I mean, having supported the resolution of responsibility to protect and then allowed that to change into re to regime change policy, um, and then not having prepared for the aftermath uh, was a failure to think through the delayed unintended consequences. And then this of course spills over into how he behaved or how the world behaved in Syria where essentially uh, R2P, the Responsibility Protect Resolution could not pass the Security Council uh, uh, regarding Syria because Russia and China felt that they had been misled by allowing R2P to be invoked in Libya. So there's some problems in Obama's uh, record which uh, prevent him from being in the, in the top tier. Every president has flaws and bad decisions. Roosevelt uh, lied to the American people deliberately about a German attack on an American destroyer uh, when in fact is the other way around, the Americans attacked first. Uh, he justified this in his mind on the importance of trying to alert or awaken the American people to the huge threat that Hitler posed both to the United States and to a broader set of values. So you can find trade-offs for every president. And that's why I say with my scorecards, I, I don't take my judgments too seriously, but as you make your own judgments, use a 3D framework. And is there a risk, uh, Joe, in that, that you're attributing morality only to successful policies? What about the president that tries desperately to do the moral thing, but fails dismally? Is that, a, in your view, is that a moral decision? I mean, I understand that consequences is one of the thing, but sometimes the unintended consequences, um, you know, are, 
you know, are negative, even though the decision was moral. How, how much for you is morality about getting it right? Well, I, I think getting it right has got to be a necessary, if not sufficient, uh, condition for, for a moral decision. But uh, if you take something like uh, Jimmy Carter and um, his human rights policy, uh, in many cases, he was unable to fully implement it. He wasn't able to, to uh, uh, bring about democracy or human rights in, in Iran, for example. Um, but you could still argue that, uh, uh, you know, elevating the position of human rights in uh, American foreign policy was of significant long-term importance. Uh, so it, it, in particular cases of Carter's human rights policy, they were indeed failures, uh, but you could argue that the, the larger pur purposes uh, uh, justified the failures, just like you could argue that uh, the larger purpose of defeating Hitler uh, justified uh, Roosevelt's lie. Thank you, Joe. Um, there's a number of questions in the um, Q&A box about populism, Semi Bozkort, Balon Mortezaj, others, asking um, about the moral claims of populists. And in particular, sometimes when those moral claims are claims which are to derogate from democratic institutions and rules. So how do we adjudicate the moral claims of populism? Well, I think what we've seen in terms of the rise of, of uh, democratic populism um, reflects some of the growth of inequality uh, in our societies. Let, let's first distinguish between a nativist, uh, narrow populism that could be used, let's say, by Orban in Hungary to justify a power grab. I'm not talking about that. I'm, I, we just... I think uh, say that's immoral, but it, but there are cases where you say that uh, uh, that the liberals who promoted globalization and didn't pay enough attention to the distributive effects on workers uh, in uh, cities and areas that were affected uh, were not thinking through uh, the full moral consequences of the frameworks that they created so-called liberal international economic order, and uh, that populism, uh, democratic populism of the left or the right uh, was a response to this, which means that populism is not immoral per se. After all, looking back in American history, uh, uh, the great wave of populism at the turn of the beginning of the 20th century brought us uh, the progressive era, era with Teddy Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson and significant reforms. So populism isn't wrong per se, it's, it's when populism becomes narrow and nativistic and ignores the, the concerns of others that we can make moral judgments uh, criticizing it. Um, I, so I, I don't, I, I mean, populism um, is a mixed bag and it's a word which is applied to a pretty broad range of behavior. Some of it's pretty awful, some of it not necessarily. So one of the claims of populists is of course, um, a, a national claim that, they, that their national institutions should not be subject to foreign influence, which is one of your categories of, you know, w when you talk about means, you talk about, you know, the need to respect other institutions. So there's a couple of questions on this. One is, was it right therefore for President Obama to come out against Brexit? Well, that's a, 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 I think the Obama position uh, could be criticized uh, on tactical or prudential grounds. In other words, was it really helpful or hurtful? But to have a position on Brexit, I think is not wrong per se. The question is whether it was prudent for him to express it uh, publicly or not. I think the, the desire of people for, for autonomy um, it, it has to be traded off against other things that they are, are uh, uh, desire in, in a democracy. And um, then the question is how much do you, uh, does a political leader in one country uh, express preferences about uh, uh, how that trade-off is made in other countries. Uh, so 
I, but I would, I would make that more of a tactical call rather than a, a deep moral call. Mm. Um, uh, Dave Mukabe asks, can you institutionalize morality? Well, we do institutionalize morality in the sense that when we uh, set up international uh, multilateral institutions and frameworks, we are creating what uh, the political scientist Robert Axelrod called the long shadow of the future. Very often, uh, students of international relations will uh, uh, model international relations, an anarchic area, no government above the states, uh, with the game of prisoner's dilemma, which is uh, a zero sum game where if two prisoners uh, uh, are caught and, and uh, uh, basically defect or squeal on each other, uh, that is the typical response in the game. Um, what Axelrod showed is that if you play prisoner's dilemma over and over and over again, which he did with a computer uh, a tournament, it turns out that the optimal strategy is tit for tat or reciprocity. So rather than taking the short run, I'll squeal on you because I know you'll squeal on me, we both realize that if I defect, uh, then the right strategy for you is for you to defect. But if I cooperate, the right strategy for you is to cooperate in terms of our long run uh, self-interest. And what he points out is if you can institutionalize the point that we're gonna be playing together for a long time, our incentives change from one which is a zero sum strategy to a positive sum strategy. Uh, Axelrod called this uh, creating the long shadow of the future. When you set up international institutions, uh, they create uh, that expectation that the game will go on and they create an incentive for a, a more moral or broader perception of the national interest than if you're in a pure zero sum situation. So I think in that sense, uh, uh, you know, you can say that uh, uh, institutions are, are ways to set a framework for morality. It doesn't mean the institutions are moral per se, but they do set a framework which allows more leeway for moral decisions. Alex Dawson asks about the middle ground, the, 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 the Congress, the other politicians, the, um, what would an example be, Joe, of an institution that affects them, that, in other words, that shapes their decision in the direction of more moral decisions? Well, very often, uh, uh, congressional leaders are, uh, will take a uh, position which is designed, they're, they're, a member of the House of Representatives in the United States is perpetually running for office. It's every two years. So soon after you're elected, you're thinking about your next campaign. So they will tend to uh, make statements or get uh, uh, press attention. And uh, very often that uh, appealing to moral issues uh, is, is an easy way to do that. Um, uh, we, and that's often the, the wrong way to approach morality in the sense that very few think through the consequences. So they'll, they'll recommend breaking relations with China because of China's uh, uh, terrible policies on, uh, on uh, Xinjiang, for example, or now we're going through this regarding Hong Kong, uh, which is a little bit more complicated case. Um, and, you know, it, you can think of different ways to criticize or to respond or to sanction behavior in Xinjiang or Hong Kong. Uh, but you wouldn't break relations because there are too many other things that the U.S. has going on with China, including stability, uh, military and political stability, but also issues like climate change and, and uh, dealing with pandemics. So the congressperson who stands up and says, I demand that we break relations with, in this case, China, but whatever state you want to assert in there, is often... Um, using morality in a very simplistic sense of trying to appeal to uh, uh, popular uh, conceptions without thinking through all three dimensions of, of means and consequences as well as intentions. And uh, so 
uh, uh, it's, it, there, this is not to berate all Congress uh, because there are many serious Congress people who think through these issues deeply. But I was just saying that there's often a, a, um, a temptation for somebody who's uh, running for office all the time to think in that first one dimensional morality, which I criticized. So, and how would you make that judgment? So between a concern for human rights and a desire to work um, on climate change and on managing the pandemic, how would you make that decision? Well, it's, it, these are the tough choices. Uh, Henry Kissinger once said that uh, uh, the most difficult decisions in foreign policy are in the range between 51 and 49%. Um, a good case of this was when Hillary Clinton was in uh, Beijing negotiating and the so-called blind Chinese uh, human rights lawyer uh, uh, escaped and the question is uh, what should the what should she do should she provide him asylum uh, or should she say look we've got important uh, negotiations to do on climate and trade and other things uh, she decided to uh, in this case to uh, basically say, if the Chinese break off those relations because I provide asylum to this human rights lawyer, uh, so be it. Um, she also thought that they would not break off those relations. Mm. Um, Federica D'Alessandra asks, what is President Trump's scorecard? What does that look like? Walk us through your scorecard of President Trump. Well, Trump's scorecard uh, on intentions uh, my argument is that his intentions as expressed in uh, uh, America First are not wrong per se. It's the way his emotional intelligence has led him to interpret that in an extremely narrow transactional way. Every political leader has to put their country's interests first because they're a trustee. And Macron has to say France first. The question is, do you think of it in narrow transactional terms as they affect me, or do you think of it in broad institutional terms? So our Trump scores poorly, not because of the stated intention, but because of the way he implements it, the way it's distorted by his, his uh, lack of emotional intelligence. On means, actually, I give Trump somewhat better rankings than you might expect, which is his use of force has been relatively restrained. Uh, you haven't seen the kind of uh, excessive, massive uses of force that uh, put uh, Lyndon Johnson and George W. Bush in the bottom category for me. Uh, his liberalism, uh, though, uh, less so in terms of means. As for consequences, uh, a proper answer is it's too soon to know the full consequences, but the weakening of institutions uh, has, in a sense, um, made it more difficult for uh, Trump or for others to have uh, moral consequences. Uh, so I would give him low uh, scores on consequences. Uh, so of, along the three dimensions, uh, mixed on number one, uh, uh, okay on number two, uh, poor on number three. And there's a specific question um, from Philip about Trump's dismantling of nuclear proliferation treaties. This is an area that you know better than most, Joe. Um, how impactful, how significant is that? Well, I think Trump's attitude toward arms control and treaties uh, in general is, is mistaken. Um, uh, the particular uh, decisions he's made uh, so far, uh, I think the, the JCPOE with Iran was a serious mistake. I think the chances of slowing Iran's uh, uh, development of, of uh, nuclear weapons were much greater within the framework that Obama had negotiated. And I don't think Trump has put anything in his place. Uh, on his efforts to deal with North Korea, I think he's botched that uh, by first threatening fire and fury, and then uh, meeting with Kim Jong-un and pretending that uh, they had a lovely relationship was a personalization, uh, a narcissistic approach to a proliferation problem 
which has probably encouraged Kim Jong Un to think that you know this guy I can I can roll it I can bluff him I can keep going. So I think he had net negative effects uh, there uh, on on those two cases. I also think it's going to make a big difference what happens to start uh, whether that's re. Uh, renewed with the uh, Russians. I think if you lose the START Treaty, uh, it will have serious effects uh, on the area of proliferation uh, because there is an implicit uh, bargain under the non-proliferation treaty that the great powers will uh, do make efforts to relate to regulate their nuclear arsenals uh, in return for the non-nuclear states uh, not going nuclear. And Joe, you've been a teacher and mentor to so many hundreds of people, including many who have been in the White House. Um, if one of your former students was in the White House today working on these issues, the, the, the issues you've just talked about, how would you advise them to manage the president? You've, you're a long standing diplomat with all kinds of different kinds of people. Um, how would you, what would be your personal advice to them on how to manage this president? Well, I, I've had a number of former students who were in the government who come to me and said, should I stay in or not? Um, and I've said, stay in as long as you can preserve your personal integrity. In other words, swallow hard, um, but if you're doing good work and uh, trying to uh, present a voice of reason within a complex organization, uh, keep it up. But that they're low enough level that they don't have to deal with the president on a daily basis. If I were um, on the National Security Council staff or, if, or working the White House so that I had to deal with the president on a daily basis and look at the way his inconsistencies and um, his looseness with the truth, uh, distort policy, then I would advise them to do something like um, what uh, Fiona Hill um, or uh, Alexander Vindman did, which is basically tell the truth and, and either quit or, or be uh, reassigned. I mean, at some point, your personal integrity is uh, so important that uh, if you should try your best to uh, persuade the president to do the right thing, but at some point you have to draw a line. It's interesting on this COVID episodes where the president has come up with some uh, extraordinarily idiosyncratic uh, answers to things, to watch uh, uh, Dr. Fauci, Anthony Fauci, try to maintain a voice of reason for science without directly contradicting the president to his face and it's a it's a tightrope act which uh, which he's been engaged in. And Joe, when you shine that spotlight about morality, your test of morality across the rest of the world, Yang Zhuzhang asks, could it be applied to secretary generals, and which ones would you give a high score to? And Dom asks, which world leaders in their responses to the COVID nineteen pandemic would you give high marks to? Um, and I. Of, I, of course, being of Kiwi origin, can't help but say he does mention New Zealand's Prime Minister, Jacinda Ardern, and I see we have a New Zealander sitting in New Zealand on this call, Rob Munro, who's also asking um, around this. So, so give us a, you know, which, which leaders are doing really well at the moment? And, and could you score Secretaries General? Well, I think the, the, uh, uh, I, if you <laughs> if you hadn't mentioned her, Nairi, I would have. I'm a great admirer of New Zealand women, but this is a it, it, her performance has really been extraordinary uh, in terms of uh, leading people as a team, uh, and quite a contrast to the rather divisive uh, way that uh, that President Trump has behaved. But I think you'd add to the list. Uh, Angela Merkel, who has handled matters in Germany quite well, and, and the recent efforts to try to think about how you bridge the north-south divide within Europe is, uh, is an important uh, uh, step forward. Um, so I think that, uh, uh, you know, my two leading candidates for praise are both women, but uh, 
uh, we'll leave that as it is. Well, let me just say that um, uh, uh, the kind of uh, populist uh, showmanship, which uh, we've seen in some of the Anglo-Saxon democracies is not uh, uh, the right way to approach this. But as for applying it to secretaries general, um, it's interesting to me that both Xi Jinping and Donald Trump responded in a similar way to the early stages of the virus, which was denial and then blame shifting. Um, and uh, so in that sense, it, it, I think it's less the, uh, uh, the nature of the system, authoritarian or democratic, and more in the uh, nature of the way the, the, uh, uh, the leaders uh, reacted. So I, I think both China and the US got off to a bad start in terms of their leadership. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, I think truth and being more attentive to uh, telling the public as much as you know and what you can uh, not know at this stage, but being open and honest about them and then trying to explain to people what the decisions are. That's where New Zealand has been a model. And shifting to the question of America, China, you know, if you were president, uh, Joe, how would you frame and pursue America's relationship with China? What, what to you should be the key elements of America's relationship with China? Well, it's an important question. And in the uh, uh, last chapter of the book, uh, I say that the two big questions which a future president is going to have to deal with are going to be the power shift uh, from west to east in terms of what I call the recovery of Asia, which obviously includes China. And the other one is the, the power shift uh, from states to non-state actors and the rise of transnational issues, which includes pandemics and climate change and so forth. But on the first of those, the China one uh, the, it's, it's extremely important uh, to manage this relationship in a way in which we realize that there will be cooperation and competition at the same time. Right now, everybody is focused on the competition and uh, it's become a political football in the uh, 2020 American election. Um, I argue in the book that it's equally mistaken to underestimate or to overestimate China. And that if we look at the uh, situation clearly, we can uh, manage a relationship where you can uh, compete in some areas, for example, sending uh, naval patrols through uh, the so-called 12 mile claims of Chinese uh, artificial islands in the South China Sea to preserve freedom of the sea, uh, uh, which, these, which is defended by the Hague Tribunal uh, in other words, that the Chinese claims are not legal. Um, you can do that at the same time that you can be working with China on ways to deal with pandemics, this one and future ones, or climate change. And that uh, a, a president is going to have to explain to the American people uh, that it's not either or, it's both. And uh, right now, what we're seeing is only one side of this being given attention. And how do you turn back the anti-Chinese and increasingly anti-Asian sentiment within the United States, but the anti-Chinese sentiment across both political parties? Um, and of course, the same will need to happen in China, but how do you do that in the United States? Well, I think it's, it's uh, going to be extremely difficult to do it uh, in, the, in the short run, in other words, before the election. Uh, Trump has decided to make China his tool for beating Biden. Uh, Trump is now uh, suffering his electoral prospects or suffering because of his mismanagement of the COVID crisis. And I think having an external enemy is, uh, is probably what he's going to use. And uh, so it, it's going to be difficult to make sure that uh, 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 Biden doesn't fall into that trap but also preserves his freedom of maneuver for a period afterwards. So I've, I've been writing various editorials. Bob Zellick has written various editorials, uh, you know, saying, keep a sense of balance here. Uh, it's not either or, you've got to learn to do both. Um, 
but I'm afraid we're in for, for the next uh, year is going to be a difficult year. Dom asks, have you ever considered running for president? Was there ever <laughs> a moment in your life when you thought maybe? Uh, no, I've, <clears throat> I've never considered uh, running for presidency or elected office. I greatly admire the people who do uh, because it's a hard, hard job. But once you make that decision, uh, you're giving up a large part of your life. Uh, you're giving up your privacy. You're giving up your uh, the luxury of following your intellectual curiosity in the areas which may not be popular. Uh, you're, it's, it, it, it's so in that sense, uh, perhaps uh, selfishly, I said, I will try to influence policy from uh, the areas where I can uh, uh, manage, which is to think clearly about policy uh, rather than try to uh, explain it. I, I have given some political speeches and political campaigns and so forth, but they've not tempted me to think that I would be good at it. Thank you, Joan. Now, just before I, I move properly to thank you, I do want to just say um, to our participants and audience here, do please be well, feel welcome to join our events at the Blavatnik School of Government. Tomorrow we have an event on will countries cooperate with Ngozi Okonji Wiala and Adam Tu, so a brilliant historian and a brilliant global leader, uh, speaking with me about the prospects for international cooperation. That's at, that's at five o'clock. And then also to say that in this time when, when evidence and public policy is so much in the domain, in the public domain, um, the school has now launched an online course, which you can do on evidence and public policy. And um, you can see on a screen in front of you um, some information about uh, that course, which is wonderfully taught by my colleagues, uh, Martin William and Julien Labon. But let me now turn and um, reflect for all of you. And Joe, I want to say the comments channel is just so full of appreciation for your wisdom and your sharing um, these thoughts with us today and for your intellect and judgment. Um, you, would, you, you started life as a, well, as we would say in Oxford, as a PPE student here at Oxford University, Exeter College, uh, as a Rhodes Scholar. Uh, we're very proud to claim you as one of Oxford's own. And let me finish today by thanking you, um, not just for being with us here today, but for your record of public service and your determination to use your intellect to help public sector leaders make better decisions. Thank you, Joseph Nye. Well, thank you, Nairon. It's great to be back at Blavatnik, even virtually. <laughs>